Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. I hope you're all doing well. Good to see everyone. Let's stand and worship together. All right, church, sing it out. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives away. Silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry that the earth respond. All creation shouts with the voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. Oh, we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the reign. here this morning we're glad that you came to worship with us if you're a guest today there's a card like this in the seat in front of you there in front uh, if you'd fill that out and uh, let us know who you are and put it in one of these boxes on the way out that says offering on it you can put these in there also that'll give us a record and I can send you a note and thank you for coming and being a part here don't know what's going on in your life uh, but I can assure you that a relationship with Jesus that's genuine and growing is the answer for whatever you're facing in life I'm really glad to see you let's take a moment welcome those who are near you let them know you're glad to see them in church this morning thanks so much for coming
Continue together this morning. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am. to be near, near to your heart, loving the world, hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one.
Your name. 
At the beginning of the semester, I was feeling pressured by the world to live in sin. At the beginning of the year, I came in with the emptiness in my heart. I came into the year with doubt. What if I can't love my kids well enough? What if this isn't what I'm supposed to do? At the beginning of this year, I came in with a very distant relationship with God. At the beginning of this year, I was struggling with being reluctant to marry us. At the beginning of the year, I came in with uncertainty for my future, struggling with my identity, and feeling unworthy of sharing. I came into this year with overwhelming grief, sadness, and overwhelmed with life in general. At the beginning of the semester, I was weighed down by anxiety. At the beginning of the semester, I was facing fears and insecurities about moving to Utah. I started out this semester as a transfer student. I walked in worry, stress, and fear of the unknown. At the beginning of the year, I brought in doubt and was really just kind of going through the motions in my walk with Christ. I came into the semester with an overwhelming feeling of being worthless. At the beginning of this year, I came in with doubts about myself. My mom died in December of last year. So my year started with um, a lot of grief and a great sense of loss. Uh, I started off this year with grief. I'm leaving that behind because I know that living for Jesus is far better than living for the world. I'm leaving that behind to live a full life in Christ. I'm leaving that behind because even in the heartbreaking situations, I can try to love my kids like Jesus loves me. I'm leaving that behind because God has shown me a more fulfilling way to live. Uh, thankfully, God has been very patient with me as I've sought to understand His calling for me and my family. and now find myself more obedient and willing to serve in the areas he's called us to serve in. I left that behind because I can lay my anxiety on Jesus and I place my faith in it. I've left that behind because I know that despite my brokenness and sinful life, I am so graciously loved, mercifully forgiven, and have the perfect example of who I should be through Jesus. I left that behind and now walking with God, I have found community, purpose, and fellowship. I left that behind because of the signs God has shown me through this community. And God has brought me to a place in my life now where I can have joy through the grief and more understanding of His love. I left that behind and was obedient to God's call by joining a church plant and investing in the people of Utah. The Lord has been faithful to provide more than I ever could have imagined by meeting my practical needs and surrounding me with a community of believers. I left that behind because the Lord revealed His faithfulness. He told me I was worthy of His love and He had a purpose for me, and I discovered that that's enough. And now I left that behind 
because I realized I need a savior and now I'm walking new with him. But what I have learned and what I'm still learning is that even though this type of loss doesn't go away, every morning that I do wake up and I feel that loss, Jesus is there with me through the loss and it will continue all the rest of my life. And the Lord has shown me trust and the verse that I stay with every day is, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hand. Aren't you glad you don't have to do life by yourself, that God provides encouragement in many ways as we go through life? We're not unique. There are other people who struggle and share that with us, and that's part of what it means to be a, a church, a community where we're able to encourage each other. God encourages us in many ways. Uh, last Sunday, I was in Hobart uh, with my mother for the first time on Mother's Day in 40 years. So I'm starting to feel like a bad son. I uh, had a great time. I visited with my cousin, Linda, who is, lives in Hobart now. And her mother, Willa May, used to grow these beautiful iris flowers. We were talking about iris flowers because my mom grows those too. And Linda said whenever her uh, mother died of cancer, she got some of those iris plants and she took them with her to Altus. That's where she lived. And she, her mother knew all the names of them, like the scientific names. And she had one that was her favorite iris. And Linda said that one year that iris was blooming and was real pretty. And she said, I don't know how it got there. But there was a clump of wheat that came up right next to it, uh, a bird brought in or whatever, but telling about that. And her dad, James, was a wheat farmer, and his, she was just, just talking about how comforting that was to see her mom's favorite flower, this clump of wheat growing up next to it. This is like, thank you, God. Just a good reminder uh, that life isn't over. We're going to see each other again. God encourages us through many ways. And if you have your eyes open, you'll see things day by day. But there's nothing that God uses more to encourage us than other people. And we see that in the text this morning in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul is leaving Ephesus. There's been a two-hour riot where everybody's yelling and screaming and, uh, because Paul had preached in what's today's Turkey. Uh, he had preached so many places that Jesus was the true God and idols were not real gods, and so it hurt the market. They, don't, they can't sell their idols anymore, so they're pitching the fit for two hours. When the town clerk finally settles everyone down, uh, this is what happens in verse 1 through 6 of Acts chapter 20. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus, these went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Paul gave and received much encouragement as he lived his life for Christ. All Christians require encouragement if they're going to be lifetime followers of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at these six verses filled with people, uh, some with names that you won't probably recognize, but these people that are living for Christ, we see encouragement taking place. And as we look at these six verses, I want, we're going to look at, the first, first of all, all Christians need encouraged. All Christians need encouraged. Uh, I would make the argument uh, that the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian who ever lived as far as his unselfish service, and yet even the Apostle Paul re required uh, encouragement. All Christians require encouragement or need encouraged while serving. We get the wrong idea sometimes that if somebody's really serving and they're doing a lot of things, then they don't need to be encouraged because they've got it all together. 
In reality, the Apostle Paul, as he goes various places, uh, and I think Acts is a really long book anyway. I think this is our third year on this. I've had things to it, but I mean, it takes a long time. But when it says here that he goes from Ephesus and then goes away, goes around and goes to Greece, that's probably 18 months. So if they had given all the details of that, it really, I mean, this, this book would be so long. But one of the things that happens while he travels, and he talks about it in 2 Corinthians, is that he was so upset about this kind of a, the, the Corinthian church, the church in Corinth, was saying things about him that were not true. Titus went to check it out. And then he's trying to, and when he's making this trip, he's worried about uh, the church at Corinth and what they're saying about him. And then Titus comes to him, he meets Titus, and he says, I was greatly encouraged by the coming of Titus. All that just to say that even the Apostle Paul needed encouragement from other people, and Titus was able to encourage him. And the more you serve, the more encouragement you actually need. It's like you can have the top-of-the-line vehicle that does all that stuff nowadays that I... My wife's got a car that's just a year old. I don't know what all it does. Uh, it, it, I finally figured out. Seth helped me where we could get some music. That was nice to have Spotify, whatever that is. I just know it, it works. Also, when my phone rings, it comes out of the speakers. I don't understand that. Anyway, you've got all this top of the line, but if you don't put gas in it, you can't go anywhere. And the further you go, the more gas you need. Uh, we went to southeastern Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago when we had to stop and fill up because we went a long way. Those of you who serve the most need the most encouragement because you're expending energy, so you need to receive it as well. All Christians need encouraged while serving, while worrying. Yeah, I said it out loud. I know we're not supposed to worry. And we are supposed to not be anxious, but the reality is that we're all a work in process, and we do worry from time to time. Uh, Paul, in verses 1 and 2 here, he's leaving Ephesus, and they've just had this two-hour riot where they're yelling and screaming, and they, they hate Paul and everybody associated with him. He's going to walk off and leave, and he is encouraging them because he knows that they're worried about what's going to happen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when Paul did not, uh, when he was thinking about the church at Corinth and worrying about what they were thinking about him, and he doesn't see Titus in, in Troas, he's upset about that, and he's encouraged later. All of us have times when we, I'll, I'll say it, when we, we're uncertain about the future, we're worried about the health of a loved one. We're worried about the choices made by a family member. We're worried about uh, employment. We're worried about, I mean, it's, you can call it whatever you want to do. I know you can call it con Christian concern, but in reality, it's worry. And during those times, we need encouragement. We need somebody to come along beside us and tell us it's going to be okay. We need someone to come along beside us and let us know that even though you're going through a change, uh, it's going to be okay. And so all, Christian needs all Christians need encouraged while serving, while worrying, uh, while adjusting, while making adjustments along the way uh, in life. We have this image of how things are going to go, and yet it never goes exactly that way. You know, uh, you go to a wedding and you see the bride and groom and they're so excited and happy and uh, I love going to a wedding. It's so full of hope. And yet, I'm, you know, there's a part of me that just wants to go and say, you know, whatever, however you think this is going to go, it isn't going to go that way. You're going to have to make some adjustments along the way. It's not, it's not all what you think of. And some of you who are uh, widows or widowed right now, you didn't see that coming. That isn't what you planned. Some of you who've been through divorce, you didn't see that coming. Some of you who've had children go a different way than you, you didn't see that coming. And when you make adjustments in life, when you have to make that adjustment, then you need to be encouraged. You need to be helped along the way. In this particular case, uh, Paul, on, in verse 3, he was going to go to Syria to celebrate Passover. And then word comes to him, he hears about it, that there's a bunch of Jewish people on that boat that are going to go celebrate Passover also that are not Christians, and they still are mad at Paul because of the impact that he had in Corinth and some other places, and they've, they're deciding they're just going to kind of let him go overboard in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. That'll be the end of him. And he hears about that, that they're going to try to kill him, 
And so after that, he, he gets with these other men and he makes that trip, trip by, on foot, but they're there to encourage him when it's like, I mean, wouldn't you have, if you had been Paul, thinking, I'm trying to do God's will, I want to go back and celebrate the Passover, and then you're going to let these people try to murder me? They're going to toss me overboard? And so he has to make an adjustment in life. Uh, and adjustments come hard when things don't turn out the way you thought they were going to turn out. You need the encouragement of others who can assure you that it's going to be okay. Uh, when I was at Hobart last week, uh, there were some younger, not young now, they're as old as me, but people that Nancy and I had been in... Uh, Sunday school with when we were young married. I'm so thrilled to still see them at church. But you know what? Every one of them was sitting almost in the exact same seat as 42 years ago. Change comes hard. I mean, you don't make it, people don't make adjustments. It, it, it comes hard. So when change is forced upon us and when there's something that happens beyond our control, we need somebody there to encourage us. All Christians uh, need encouraged. Life is not an exact science. Uh, following Jesus is not a, something we know everything that's going to happen ahead of time. And so all Christians need encouraged. Secondly, all Christians can encourage. I read this past week in 1 Thessalonians 5 where it says, Encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Uh, this isn't a spiritual gift to encourage others. It's something all Christians can do. It's something that all Christians are expected to do. Uh, the word encourage means to build up rather than to tear down. It means to, in, uh, to instill uh, courage into someone else uh, to give them confidence. Uh, when, I was the, when I first started preaching, I wore a suit every day, or not every day, every Sunday. And when I was at Hobart early 20s before I went to seminary uh, I'd get there early and the first guy who came to church every Sunday lived just down the block was Don Harris's dad Dewey Harris and he would come in and he would look me over and he would pray for me and then he'd look me over and he'd uh, straighten my tie and then he would look at my lapel and he would pick off any bit of that's where I get that's that's my illustration of a nitpicker uh, which I appreciated that. I didn't, that didn't bother me. Uh, but when it comes to the lives of other people, we need to be encouragers, not nitpickers. It's what we say to them as far as what we say about them. There's plenty of positive we can find about anyone and everyone, and that's what we need to emphasize as we encourage. All Christians can encourage, and we see various ways here how that can happen. First of all, we can encourage by speaking. It says in verse 1, or verse 2, that after Paul had given them much encouragement, literally that means having exalted them with much talk. There's power in positive words. Don't just think things, say them when they're positive. To build somebody up, to tell them it's going to be okay. Anything positive that you can say about them. And that needs to be determined by biblical truth. Don't say that's a great thing that you're a liar. Uh, that's not good. Uh, you don't disobey the commandments, but to, to tell people. Don't just think it. Say it. The power of positive words. And then when you make yourself talk, if you're a great communicator and encouraging other people, what you're going to discover is that one of the things that that involves is learning how to be a really good listener. So that when people know that you care and you explain that to them, that it's going to be okay, God's in control, God's got this, God's going to help, and then they start talking to you. That, that's not your green light to tell them five stories about yourself. You listen. I'm amazed at how, how much we're able to help other people. The greatest counselor is somebody who can listen. And so part of speaking, by, while speaking, or by speaking we can encourage others, but that doesn't mean give them a lecture uh, it means to be able to say positive things and encouraging things, truthful things. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the last thing he told Timothy before, before Paul died uh, in, first, in 2 Timothy 4, he said, devote yourself to the preaching of the word, uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort. So if you're going to reprove and rebuke, also you, you need to exhort. So, yeah, there's some things we help people with, and we encourage people with things that aren't, they're not going the right way, but always leave it on a positive note. Exhort, build up. And so all Christians can encourage by speaking, by writing. 
In verse 2, it says that when he had gone through those regions, as I mentioned, that was about 18 months uh, that he spent traveling uh, from Ephesus all the way up and then across and then down to Greece. Uh, and during that time, uh, he wrote 2 Corinthians uh, while he was traveling. Then when he arrives in Greece and primarily in Corinth, uh, it says he stayed there for three months, and during those three months, he wrote 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Romans, and probably Galatians. Paul the Apostle was writing these things to other people and that eventually made their way into the New Testament. What you write is not going to make it into the New Testament because the New Testament is not still being written. Uh, but the power of written words uh, is amazing. Um, that would include texts. I get texts by people. Uh, that includes emails, that includes handwritten notes, that includes all kinds of things. What writing does when you encourage somebody is it allows you to get in somewhere for sure that you may not have been able to get into otherwise. Like, they may not be home or they, not be, they may not be available where you could have one-on-one -on -one where you could converse with them, but when you send some kind of written communication, uh, it, always, it always hits the mark. It always gets there. I've always written notes. Most of you probably, or many of you, have probably received a note from me at some time. Uh, I just, I do that. Uh, I never, I, I knew people said they liked getting notes, but I didn't realize how potentially powerful that was. Uh, until several years ago, I was visiting in the home of a, a guy who was dying. He was, they had a hospital bed in the living room, and I was there. He was not alert. Uh, but his wife was, I was visiting with her, and I'd been communicating for quite a while with them. And while we were talking, I just happened to look up on the mantel, and there were lined up, each of the notes that I had sent to them were up there on the mantel like some kind of prize. And I thought, I can't believe that. That it didn't take me very long, and if you've ever read one, you notice I don't take a whole lot of time for penmanship. You, we can either have a lot of notes or we can have a few written very well. Uh, but I, when I was there, I just thought, I wasn't able to be here all the time when her husband's dying. But when the mail came and it was something that wasn't another opportunity to give to an annual fund, uh, that was encouraging. So don't, don't doubt the power of that, and you be involved in it. You can do that. Uh, by speaking, by writing, uh, by giving, uh, these representatives that are mentioned here, all these men that are traveling with Paul, uh, uh, mentions uh, these different ones, uh, Sopatar, the Berean, son of Paranus, uh, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius of Derby, Timothy, Tychicus, Trophimus, these guys are representatives of the churches that are taking up an offering to give to the church in Jerusalem. And they're all traveling together. They don't want to give anybody any act. You know, Paul didn't just put all the money in his pocket and say, trust me. Uh, you know, he didn't do that. He had all these people traveling together. And they're in the, they're in the process of going to give money uh, to the church at Jerusalem that's experiencing a drought, a famine, and they're going to help them. And that encouraged one of the things you can do to encourage other people and others is to give. Uh, you give of money, you give of your time, you give of your energy, you give to be a, a, a positive. Uh, many of you uh, are going to give next hour. You're going to give and teach children. And that's awesome. Uh, I saw the other day someone quoted Socrates, which I'm, I'm not quoting him instead of the Bible, but he just said, if you want to change a culture, it's done by uh, what you teach the children and who does the teaching? That's how you change the future. Well, you could talk about the public education system, but you can also talk about the church. What we teach the children, and who does the teaching? We want that to be done well. Many of you do that. You give. Some of you are going to give and teach adults. Uh, some of you give and serve in various ways. Some of you give uh, and help with foster birthdays in Custer County. Some of you give as far as helping with foster care. Uh, so there's just a lot of ways to give. But one of the ways we encourage others is not just by talking about it, not just by thinking about it, but we actually give. We're never more like God than when we give. For God so loved the world that He gave. 
his only begotten son. So by giving. Uh, also by forgiving, Paul in Corinth had some issues and uh, mainly were not caused by Paul. They were caused by people in the church in Corinth and they had to work through some things. And eventually they do reconcile. And I wouldn't say that the church at Corinth became Paul's favorite, but he does spend three months there. Uh, and he forgave. And they forgave. One of the ways we encourage other people is by forgiving them. Do you know when you hold a grudge against somebody, you kind of keep somebody in chains? And I know the verse, Romans 12, 18, if possible, as far as it depends on all people, be at peace. Or as, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. I can quote that. Quoted it for 40 years. Do your part and leave it there. But you know what? When you still, for whatever reason, won't speak to someone, won't look at someone, when you hold a grudge, it hurts. I learned a long time ago, I don't hold grudges against anybody. Now, there have been a stump or two that I plowed around just because it wasn't going to move and we just have to function. But I don't want to hold a grudge because it kills me. You know, when you hold a grudge, it's like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. It ain't going to work that way. And so one of the ways we encourage, and this is part of life. This is what, you know, Seth, you can add this to your wedding deal for next time. You gotta have to, you're going to have to forgive. Y'all are all starry-eyed today, but there's going to come a day when somebody's going to... Well, it didn't ever happen in my marriage, but I've heard that it happens in other marriages. You know, that forgiveness is essential in a church. Forgiveness is essential in a life group. Forgiveness is essential. So one of the ways we encourage is, ah, come on in here. Bring it in for the real deal. We're, uh, we forgive each other. And then also, uh, not only uh, by speaking, by writing, by giving, by forgiving, but also by including. You include other people. Uh, Paul, the, the shift here, uh, Luke is writing the book of Acts. And then he, toward the end here, he says, we sailed. So Luke gets back with Paul. He's with him from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And then five days we came to them at Troas where we stayed for seven days. So Luke's back in the picture with Paul. But earlier Paul had been with Timothy. He's been so, with Sopater, the Berean. He's been with all these people. And he includes... Not just his best buds. He doesn't just include Timothy, the one he's mentoring to take over for him. He doesn't just, he includes everybody. We can be so encouraging to other people where we just include them in our lives. I hope you stay for the meal. Uh, after church, there's not even a place to give to missions or anything. You just go eat. That's just cheap. It's free and no guilt. It's a guilt-free meal. And you show up and eat. And it'd be a great thing if you went over there and you see somebody sitting by themselves and you just go sit by them. You say, well, I don't know them. I, I don't know them either. But that's, that's last week at Hobart, I'm sitting there and my mom sits towards in front of the balcony, but not too close. So we're sitting back there. And I keep seeing this guy back there on the back row, and I'm thinking I'm kin to him. And I think he's a certain person, and I told him, I said, is that so-and-so? And she said, I, I don't know. I don't know all your kinfolk. Uh, you don't even know him yourself. Uh, so I, I think that I, I've got to go back there. And we've got a few, you know, so I, so I go back there, and I say, hi, I'm Earl. How are you doing? And, and he says, I'm John. And I thought, ooh, wrong guy. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't who I thought it was, and, and, but, I, but I'm, a, I'm a quick, I've been doing this a long time. I said, well, man, John, I'm so glad you came today. I'm so glad you came and worshiped with us today, and thank you for, and it, he lit up like a Christmas tree. He's like, whoa, thank you, and they were back there, looked like a knot on a log, but somebody spoke to him. I'm going to send the, the preacher a finder's fee uh, for what I did last week, just while I was on vacation. I'm still, uh, but, you know, they're just sitting back there by themselves. Nobody's talking to him. Everybody's going around him. And I go back, and for the wrong motive, I thought I was related to him. And, uh, but you just speak to somebody, include them, and it encourages them. You don't have to remember everybody's name. But it'd be great if we spoke to people, and when you speak to people, it encourages them. We, we can get better at making people feel welcome. 
what, whatever their circumstances in life is, they need to know that they're in a place where they're accepted, they're welcomed, and we're glad they're here. All Christians need encouraged. You need it, I need it. All Christians can encourage. And then finally, all Christians should encourage. It should be a part of our DNA as followers of Jesus Christ that we build other people up instead of tear other people down. That we want to build them up, we want to encourage them um, intentionally. It says in verse 1 that Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them. So he's leaving Ephesus. He knows they've just had a two-hour riot there in the city and that they, the Christians are the focus of who they don't like. And so Paul sends for them. He asks them to come, and then he encourages them before he leaves. This was not a chance meeting in Walmart while he's buying some snacks before his trip. It, that wasn't it. It was he intentionally brought them in, encouraged them, and then they were better able to do things. They, he, wanted, he did it on purpose. We need to be intentional that when we know somebody is struggling, when we know that somebody is alone, when we know that somebody's going through something, we speak, we write, we give, we, whatever it is that we're going to do, we're going to intentionally do that. We're not going to leave it to chance. Uh, one of my favorite stories about my dad I've heard after he had died, and a man in the church in Hobart said uh, he had had trouble with one of his adult children and you know everybody knew about it not everybody but a lot of people did and he said your dad came to me after a Sunday morning church and he said I'm going to be at I'm coming to your house this afternoon with another man Kenneth he said Kenneth and I are going to be at your house this afternoon at two o'clock and we're going to visit with you and pray for you and this man said how much that meant because he didn't know I mean, my dad didn't say, and, and I say this too, and I know we mean well when we do this, but we'll say things like, if you ever need anything, just let me know. If I can help, let me know. Well, if somebody's life's just crushed, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, Earl said that if I needed something, I should let him know. So uh, let me see. What's his number? Let me call. No, they're just, their life's on the, they're, they've, they can't decide what to do. Just show up and be obnoxious and, and be there. You're not being obnoxious. That's what, you're not. Okay, so I've kind of, I've spent my entire life going into situations without being invited. If you're waiting for an invitation, you're not going to get it. And you don't, you're courteous, you're kind, but you know who's hurting. You know who's struggling. You know who's lost a loved one. You know who's been through surgery. You know who's... Just show up intentionally. Uh, every Christian should encourage intentionally, routinely. It says in verse 2, uh, when they had gone through the regions and given them encouragement. So everywhere Paul went for these 18 months, he's going from Thessalonica. He's going down here to Corinth. He's going... He had been in Ephesus. He went through Troas. He goes all these places. And he is... That's his routine, that when he shows up, he gives encouragement, that he builds people up, not tears them down. Our routine in life should be that we are the encouragers, that we build people up. Even if they've been through the worst thing possible, we encourage them. We're a source of light. They're glad to see us show up. Uh, Chad Chaplin's grandparents uh, and Terry Boyd's grandparents lived in Atoka, uh, the country there, they would buy an old piece of land that had been abused, they'd fix it all up, and then they would sell it, and then they'd go buy another piece of land that's been abused. There's plenty of places like that down in southeastern Oklahoma. You can, you can pick a few. Uh, anyway, and so they would do that. That's just, that was their routine. That's what they did. That's how they rolled. They just found bad places and fixed them up and sold them, and that's, that's what they did. That ought to be the way that we roll as far as Christians that we walk into situations, it's our routine that we encourage people that are discouraged. We build people up. After they walk away from being with us, they're encouraged that they can face the day routinely. All Christians should encourage. And then finally, unselfishly, it says in verse 1 that after the uproar was over, 
Paul calls them in and he encourages them. Well, if I'm Paul, who are they mad at more than anybody? Paul. They've been having a riot for two hours, and he's the subject of what's going on. And, they, and uh, it, it seems like he would have needed to take some me time to get more focused and more encouraged so that he's able to move on in life because they've been saying all But no, he goes right in there and encourages them because he isn't just thinking about himself. He's thinking about them. In verse uh, 6 here, it says, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, and we stayed there seven days. Earlier, when they went from Troas to Philippi, it took two days so now it takes five days. You can read between the lines and they've had some storms. It took them three extra days to get across the top there of the Mediterranean Sea where it goes north. And Paul didn't arrive and, you know, get on the banks and just shaking like, ah, oh, I got to have some, I need, a, I need a, a mental adjustment day. You know, I need, to, I need some time to myself. He'd just jump right in there and help. When you, like, when you make life about yourself, you don't do much. But when you make life about others, then you, you keep on keeping on. You encourage. And you can't be selfish and be able to consistently help others and encourage others in everything that they do. I think that one of the reasons we, we always struggle, I think every church struggles, to get people to consistently serve in various areas it's like nobody wants to commit to be responsible to lead sixth graders for 45 times next year. It's like, I want to have the freedom that if I want to move and shake and go do something else, I'm going to do it. I'm just kind of got my own lifestyle going here, and I don't want to plug in and be long-term committed to anything. Well, that's selfishness. To be able to serve and encourage, I can't make life about Earl. I can't turn inwardly and try to discover the deepest thoughts in my mind and the many ways in which I have been hurt or offended. I've got, it's like, I want to make life about giving to others and encouraging. Dwight L. Moody pastored in Chicago in the late 1800s. Church grew enormously because he was at a time where he preached the Bible as the Word of God and people came to hear that because a lot of people didn't do that but also it grew because that church was so welcoming to all people and they told the story of this little boy who was going to catch, catch the bus and go across Chicago and go to Moody's church and uh, someone said well son why don't you just go to a church here you know there's a lot of churches in this area that are a lot closer why are you going to go all the way across on the bus and go to Moody's church and here's his, his statement. I said, the little boy said, they know how to love a feller over there. I want us to be a church that knows how to love a feller and a gal, whoever. Life's hard, and in some ways I think it's getting harder. I don't know if that's just me getting older or if that's really what's going on, but I know this. I know when people come to church... We need to know how to love them and how to encourage them so they can go on. Let's stand for prayer. God, thank you for all the people you've used in my life to encourage me through all kinds of situations and circumstances. Many of them seated here, standing here uh, this morning. Thank you for them. Help me to return the favor in the kingdom of God by being encouraging to all those that I come in contact with uh, as life uh, goes by. Help us to be on the side of those who encourage others as your kingdom comes and your will is done. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be here at the front. If you want to talk to someone, you need to pray with someone uh, about some circumstance. If you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, you want to recommit your life, you need to talk to someone about being baptized, whatever it is. I'll be here for that. Or even if you don't feel comfortable coming now, I'll be out here in the commons area. Just look me up after we're done. Uh, thank you so much for being here this morning. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thy 
the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who hath shown us our Savior and scattered. glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. And all glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who have borne so glad that you joined us today. Immediately following the 1030 service, we are having an all church meal in the FLC. We would love for you and your family to come and join us. Then this Wednesday at six o'clock in the church parking lot, we are having an end of the school bash. It'll have snow cones, inflatables, bingo with prizes, and some hot dogs. So we would love for you and your family to come out and celebrate the end of the year with us. And as the summer approaches, we want to remind you guys that registration is now open for all of our kid and youth events. We would love for you guys to join us. We have so much stuff planned. It'll be a great summer. But before you go, we want to remind you to abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build the church, and go make disciples. You are dismissed. <laughs>